Kaminsky, and I'll be giving you a little presentation about an internship I did this summer up in Maine, worked with some seabirds. Here we go. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a fifth year senior, actually four and a half. I'll be graduating this December. Uh, I'm originally from Mansfield, Texas, kind of in the DFW area. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. Uh, I did my freshman year at Tarleton State. Uh, I transferred in here, and I've been here ever since, and I'll be graduating in a few weeks, like I said. Uh, like most of you, I grew up, you know, probably hunting and fishing, hiking, being outside, kind of sparked my interest in getting a, a career in this field. And uh, birds the word. I really like birds a lot, and I really want to pursue birds as kind of a career, so uh, this internship is perfect for me. And that's a little turn chick that's in my pocket right there. All right, so I work for uh, National Audubon Society Seabird Restoration Program, uh, otherwise known as Project Puffin. It was started in 1973 by Dr. Steve Kress. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows what a puffin looks like, but you'll see one later. Uh, so there's a main island. Uh, puffins were pretty much extirpated. They're gone. There's two breeding pairs left in the United States. And this guy kind of started to self-fund his own program to hand raise chicks on the main island. And they go out to sea and come back. Hopefully, they start and reestablish a colony on this island. And it turned out successful, and it's been going on ever since pretty strong. And so uh, this program is actually a model for many other worldwide seabird restoration projects. You know, Japan, they're doing auklet stuff, all, stuff all over the world, Mexico, all over the place. And they do a lot of long-term studies, mainly looking at population trends over time of the birds they're trying to help reestablish. They do a lot of uh, uh, studies, long-term studies on the forage fish versus climate change. So the Gulf of Maine is warming up really fast, affecting a lot of the fish, the bird eat. We look at a lot of stuff like that. And there's some endangered species that nest in some mounds that we take care of youth work with a lot of U.S. Fish and Wildlife people with that, that stuff. So I worked on uh, the island's called Eastern Egg Rock. It's a seven acre island, about eight miles off Maine's coast. Pretty small. It's about the size of pretty much a few football fields, imagine, just in the middle of the ocean. A bunch of rocks. And so my living situation, <clears throat> there's a five person crew. This is the main four person crew. Uh, we have one person that rotates out every couple of weeks. So we get a boat every two weeks that brings us supplies, food, water. Uh, these jugs right here, what all our drinking water is in. If you run out of that, you're pretty much screwed. You're going to be drinking rainwater, which is kind of nasty. Um, like I said, no running water, no electricity. This picture right here is our little cabin where we kind of did a bunch of our data. We kind of hang out in during the day, cook our meals. We had a little propane stove. We'd cook stuff in. Uh, no refrigeration, so it's just a lot of fresh vegetables, you know, canned stuff. Stuff living out in the field, pretty much. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we had an outhouse, kind of a composting toilet situation. You're just living with each other. It's kind of gross, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, so this is some pictures. I got a lot of pictures in here, so just be ready for a lot of pictures. So this is my tent. This is what I slept in every single night for three months on the island. This is like all from the first day we got here, so everything's just skewed, thrown everywhere. So this is our cabin. There's some tent platforms we put our stuff on. We had little fires in here. So this is the inside. This is like kind of a data center where we had an island computer it's where we cook stuff. It's got crap everywhere there. There's a little bench we can stay down on. Banana, banana hammock. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, uh, so when the boats come, it's a big rock. And you can't just, it's not like a beach where you just you know, pull up your boat on, jump out, grab your supplies. So we have to row out all our supplies about 100 yards in these little Avon dinghies. And you can fit a lot of stuff. And they're probably about this big. And you can fit 1,000 pounds of stuff in there. It's crazy. We had five people in there at once. Um, you know, it's, you may think you know, you're eating just a lot of canned beans and stuff like that, but we actually make some pretty cool stuff. We had a little camp oven. Um, the significance of this, International Guillemot Appreciation Day, is created by the program. It's just like these birds called guillemots, and you just try to make stuff that looks like I'm going to eat it. This is a brownie. Very delicious on the island. This is a blueberry uh, wild rhubarb pie. We have wild rhubarb going on the island. We baked a pie with it. Um, and a bunch of these pictures, you'll see paint sticks coming out of my head like, Matt, why the heck do you have a paint stick coming out of your head? Well, some of the nesting birds, um, terns will actually, if you walk through their nest, they'll dive bomb you. And they have really sharp little short beaks and then the blood everywhere, as you'll see, is a casualty of a tern strike to the head. There's like blood rushing down one of my uh, work, my other work purples you have face or whatever. And, um, so yeah, we wear these paint sticks so they'll attack the highest part of your body and they'll hit that and distract you and not make you run back to the cabin and have gut and front blood rushing down your face every day. And uh, kind of, I, I don't know if this video worked, but it's kind of, so imagine living on an island with 6,000 seabirds. You imagine it'd be quite loud. 
And uh, hopefully this video will work and you'll be able to. Oh, is there any sound? I don't know how to work that.